Right, I believe we're live, as far as I can see. Right, let's have someone in the room then, just setting my mind at ease, just to make sure that we are live. Mm -mm. Anybody in the room yet? Actually, because we're in the page, as opposed to the group this week, which I'm hoping people would have seen, I can actually type stuff in the comments and it should appear, which is nice. Timothy, great. Okay, there we go. And Stacy's here. Bum, 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 bum. Look at that. What a lovely smiley face. That just sums it up. Look at that. Brilliant. Um, actually, I I did put that uh, the live TV link. We shouldn't have any problems in the page today. One of the reasons we've moved to the page is because um, all your names are going to show up in full glory like that. We got rid of that. If I type, it will come up as Sports Therapy Association in case I want to type something. Right. Fantastic. Right. Welcome. Welcome to... Um, Let's talk about Sports Therapy Association, our weekly web chat. Uh, we've got a few new people joining us each week, which is fantastic. Um, new members and non-members. Uh, remember, you can tell your friends, if you've got fellow therapists who aren't members, um, they're welcome to come along, especially if they don't belong to any other organ, well, even if they do. But if they're just curious about the SDA, this is probably one of the best places uh, which they can come along and meet people. Gary is normally in the house. and Oh, no, he's not in this week, is he? He's doing his extension. Um, but um, Summer, I'm sure, will be around and talking on behalf of him. Um, yes, yeah, so do spread the word, as I know a lot of you already are. Um, tonight on the Sports Therapy Association, let's talk about. I'm uh, very excited. It's somebody actually, we, we said from the beginning, which we, we want to give you gifts, gifts, gifts. It is a gift. Guests who um, you want to see. And this name has come up quite a few times now. So we've managed to get hold of uh, Mike Rice. A lot of you have done courses with Mike um, and uh, a lot of you are interested. So it's going to be a fantastic chance for you to have a chat with Mike, ask some questions. Um, tonight's uh, particular chat is going to be about um, anatom anatomical variation, which I think is a really interesting topic because it helps therapists meet the real world we're not really taught about it enough especially on lower level studies level three and level four you're kind of taught to palpate for these areas and if the palpation for example on the posterior superior like spine is is different then you're kind of writing down oh this person's got hip pain because they've got you know a pelvic tilt lateral to the left or something or when when it comes to the real world um we know that you can't put maybe as much um uh, significance to that as we were taught initially we're taught how to feel it and recognize it and make a note but what we're going to do tonight thanks to mike grice um and i'm hope i'm hope i haven't just taken away one of his perfect examples but we're going to be looking for example at how the human body um does have natural variation it's normal that we're slightly different we're not all robots um so that's what we're talking about um I'll give a warning now but we will mention it again tonight there is going to be videos um which do show cadavers, um, cadavers, however you want to say it. Um, so, um, yeah, if, well, first of all, even if you're good with it, then make sure there's no little kids. If you're babysitting little Johnny on the side of the couch, then maybe move him slightly so he can't see the screen. Uh, I'll give you a good warning when we're going to do it, but Mike's going to show how um, looking at a dissection and, and having the opportunity to go to these labs and do some of the workshops he's going to talk about, which he runs. It can be a great, great, great opportunity. But as long as you are ready to see what you're going to see so that's going to be one of the topics right um just having a little look room room is filling up nicely welcome everybody 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 look at this we cater for all sorts of people here we've even got kind of football hooligans and it's not really 2000 scary movie style Matt. it just sounds more like far show or something or anyway Good to see you, Matt. Good to see you, everyone. Right, so without further ado, let's bring up Mr. Mike Grice. Dun, dun, dun. There we are. Hello, mate. Hey, Matt. How you doing, mate? I'm sorry. I just started going into kind of... Oh, here's an example of uh, anatomical variation. <laughs> Stop. You've got someone who's going to be talking all about that, you idiot. Um, so, so there we go. Thanks for joining us, mate. Good to see you. How's no, things? you're welcome. Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. Yeah, busy back in the clinic again. Um, yeah, it's been a busy few weeks, getting used to everything. Uh, um, hopefully, face-to-face -face teaching again in October. So, uh, interesting. Yeah, back to fantastic. it. Fantastic. 
So you in clinic um, seeing patients, are you face to face? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing uh, because of the spread out nature of uh, of the work now. Um, I'm only in two days a week, so uh, but they're pretty chocker days now. Um, obviously, with the timings in between people, it spreads out the day a little bit. But um, yeah, so it was, it was a long long day today. <laughs> but of course, uh, you know, looking forward to this evening immensely. In fact, I have been looking forward to this quite a lot that's very kind of you i'm sorry it's only taken until now to get you along but um, yeah episode 13 unlucky for some so. <laughs> exactly oh, i hope you would yeah. have noticed that damn it. <laughs> uh but um until now we have been focusing a lot on covid19 and which has been great and we've had some guests giving some fantastic advice like we had um uh oh, my mind's got blank now Malcolm from Sports Injury Fix talking yep. about kind of the process to put into place. Um, we've had a lot of great advice um, from people, but tonight we're going to forget about COVID-19 for a while. Um, and we're going to talk about something much more clinical, which is where you, Mr. Clinical, comes in, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, people, feel free if you do want to ask any questions, um, then then I'll, we are both looking at the comments side and we can see who you are. So yep. as soon as you've got a question, let us know and um, we will get through to you, I promise you. But let's start then. Um, Mike. Yeah. How how did you get into taking people into laboratories and showing them dead bodies? <laughs> um, it. Yeah. So um, I started. Uh, it was on the osteopathy degree. So in our uh, well, I did uh, first couple of years at Keele University, and uh, in the first year, we um, I think it was within the first kind of first kind of few months, we we got taken into the um, undergrad uh, dissection labs. And uh, we basically what happens there is um, the medical students do dissection work and prepare the specimens. And uh, then you're uh, as an undergrad left with uh, what's called a pro section. So that's a, um, something that's already been dissected. And uh, so that you can you can have a look at um, the various um, various bits and bobs, depending on what you're depending on what you're um, interested in looking in. So, um, yeah, that, that's where it all started, really. And we went every year and the, the, the osteo degree I did was five years. So we went every year for the five years. And um, at the end of that, I then did a postgrad certificate in clinical anatomy at Kiel. So uh, I did a f further study for two years. So you've been do you think as far as you know, because you meet a lot of people in your courses who have come from different backgrounds, yeah. you were kind of thrown into it pretty early then in your degree. Do you think it's something yeah. which is missing from other courses and could be included? Or do you think it's right to wait until you've got to kind of your level of studies? It's, it's a bit of a weird one, that because I think um, I sometimes get level three um, newbies coming on to the cadaver workshops that we do. And they are they're just blown away. Some of them are using it as an, an anatomy um, study. Um, so because they've been they don't have a kind of 3D mind. So they look at the book and uh, they find it very difficult to work out where things go from and to. And especially, um, you know, the, the shoulder, for example, is, is, a, is a classic one. And you're kind of like, well, where does that bit go? Where does that bit go? And when they can get their hands on and have a look at it, uh, they can see it in the flesh. Uh, literally then uh, that they can understand how it moves and uh, uh, so sometimes really early on but uh, sometimes people don't feel ready early on and they and they wait until they've been practicing for a couple of years and, and then they and then they come into the lab so I guess it's personal preference it's um, kind of like like everything really but uh, yeah we, we get uh, we get all sorts um, and and even um, on the last one um, oh god who did we have we had a retired podiatrist and she was in her 80s uh, and she did the last workshop in, in Kiel that we did. Uh, and she she lo absolutely loved it. She hadn't done any uh, anatomy study for years, but she was she was fascinated. Fantastic. Do you think because I haven't done a workshop yet like that, but the only thing the closest I've come to it has been the kind of uh, body works exhibitions, which yeah. I was lucky enough when I was living in Spain. I think I saw one of the first ones because um, they were there before they came to the UK. And that was just a life change. I mean, I think yeah, I saw it either years and years, years ago. Um, do you think that is a useful thing for people who maybe aren't quite ready to go straight into workshop? If they are a little bit kind of queasy, not sure, is that an eye opener? Do you think? It's yeah, definitely. Thing? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the way that they the way that they preserve those specimens and the way they present them is uh, is just brilliant. Again, it's um, obviously you can't get hands on with it, so it is that kind of step back and and like like an exhibition, but. Um, 
uh, yeah, for a, for an initial start into into seeing cadaveric work or dissection work, that I think that's yeah, re really really good. I've I've loved it. Um, I've loved all of the exhibitions like that that I've been to. Well, I I'm gone who aren't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you love that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a great. I mean, I've got level three and level four students, and um, yeah, I mean, as soon as I sh a lot of the slides, I'll start off with the fate when we're doing the skin, for example. Mm -hmm. I think to truly appreciate the skin and it's, I think it's, I've had, well, it's the biggest organ, all the lovely things you learn about it. And we cover that quite quickly um, because it leads on nicely to it being the sensory input and everything kind of. Yeah. But yeah. remember from the show, there was the guy with the skin over his shoulder, like a coat sort of thing. And it was just such a, it showed the art and the beauty of the exhibition as well. Yeah, so once definitely. I've showed them that, um, I do cut it off just below the belly button because obviously, well, you can understand why a lot of these guys decided to offer themselves to be specimens. Um, so I took that off. Once they go onto YouTube and they start looking at all this, they've naturally got an interest. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're lucky enough now for it to be, it's permanent, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure what it is with COVID-19, but we've got the permanent place now in Piccadilly Circus, which people can go to and check it yeah, out. Yeah, it's, it's well worth it. If, no, if people haven't been before, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, really good. It's a good one. Um, right, so during this now your workshops we will start with you've, you've been kind enough to give us a few videos which we are going to look at yeah. and i will let people know if anyone's not quite sure then i don't know you can always get a cushion or something i just know that i know people who are very queasy with this and even when i'm teaching i warn people that we're going to have a look at rotate there's nothing like learning it even 2d rather than having a picture book and like pencil yeah drawing. yeah so i know people can be squeamish if they've never seen this before so we will warn you but um what was i going to ask you i was going to say um yeah you because of covid19 you haven't got any face to face workshops going on now but have you managed to put together like an online version or something or? um it's it's really difficult i've um because obviously the you know the reason for doing it is so that you can get hands on so it, it is one of those things that we've we've had to uh, put on the back burner we did have one uh, scheduled for in kcl because i've got i do work at king's college london as well and um, uh, we usually arrange two workshops there a year, but we've uh, we've had to cancel that one as well. It was end of August that one, so we're good. We're going to. I, I was toying with the idea of trying to do it in October, but even that, I think, you know, if there's a second wave or anything, you know, and also um, people uh, reticent to book on just in case it doesn't happen again. So uh, so I'm I'm gonna um, postpone it till April next year. So uh, hopefully. <laughs> in april we'll we'll be back to normal but that that's the plan it's a wise man i mean who the hell would try and organize any sort of conference or workshop in october <laughs> you'd have to be absolutely stupid wouldn't you as, um, as i was saying that, i was thinking oh <laughs> shit <I'm> thinking... <laughs> oh my god all day long anyway yeah let's not go into that but yeah very wise very wise very wise very wise okay right um I think, well, no, before we go into the video, let's, um, what are some of the advantages, do you think, the main kind of things which people take home with them from actually going to one of these workshops? I, th I think it is the variation in anatomy. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the big one of the big things. And then it, you can see the kind of light bulb switch going in people's head and they're like, well, if that's like that, then when we do that test, that can't be right, can it? And is that exactly yeah so it's it is that moment when uh, when people understand the the complete differences from one person to another and even side to side differences as well so um yeah i mean the, the, there's a, a study uh, similar to what you mentioned in the in the intro uh, that looked at the asis um sizes uh, from side to side it was done in manchester and uh, there was um there were differences from side to side on the same person so if you yeah if you are doing a pelvic tilt exam examination um, and and thinking yes this side is anteriorly tilted compared to this side then it may just be a longer ASIS and and you know you, you're kind of uh, you're diagnosing them a dysfunction when the, there isn't one there it's just a, an anatomical variation um, and and that, that that's a that's a really um, that's a really key thing I think for me when I very first started doing it it was um, in the labs we had um, we had a five-headed quad Oh, wow. um, so uh, yeah, we had someone with quintriceps instead of quadriceps, and uh, somebody as well had a three-headed bicep, so the tricep on the front, and um, it was the same tendon insertion, but the there was a di distinct um, three muscle bellies in the bicep rather than two. So th and that that's what got me 
you're hooked like that 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 was it it's um uh, and then you just want to find out more and more and more and obviously there aren't many people who donate their bodies to uh, to the lab so you don't know how many variations are out there we're, we're just kind of lucky to stumble across across the ones that that come up in the in the labs at the time when we're doing the work so um yeah it is uh, that, that that's a uh, that's a key moment i think for people i think it's because i mean i'm just i talk about the asas and pss because i still cringe i have to teach level three or no level yeah even level threes and the fast tracks yeah. and to show that they're professionals now they have to do a little posture analysis before they start you know put it down and that that's what they're looking out for and and they so we do these role plays and they're looking at it and writing it down and then they've got to do a pre-consultation and uh, and they've got to do it because they've got to pass the exam that's what the yeah. external qualifier wants to see sort of thing yeah but yeah. it's um yeah it's interesting i think it has to be that way and then later on when you start working and maybe go to these workshops you realize that do the test i think we're not saying don't do any of the tests but there's other factors isn't there which we can really yeah I, th I think the the test procedure doing any of those tests are um they're a comfort blanket for their patient so if, if they go to the gp they, they don't really get examined um and if we're doing a thorough examination even if the results at the end of it aren't very useful it's 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 comforting to know that you're being looked after and someone's paying attention to you so um it is it's part of that kind of theater of a of an assessment really isn't it so, it's yeah. comforting if it's done in a positive way but i know yeah true students, yeah. if you're going around a bit like a selling a car and kicking tires or looking at shoulders like that and going yeah writing things down they're just yeah, gonna be, what, yeah. what's wrong oh just your shoulders have you see how different they were and you know yeah yeah that's a favorite question is uh so if it, it oh yeah i've noticed that this shoulder's a bit higher well it's not how do you know that one's not lower so, yeah, it's a good one, isn't it? yeah it's so true uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. I, no idea yeah no idea so yeah there, well, um there, there was uh um a couple of a couple of papers that i sent through to uh to matt um uh, last couple of days so uh, we'll put those in the facebook group i think but there, there are um the variations of, of um uh the scapula or all the different variations that that there are and um, I've um, I've made a few notes because I'm a bit sad. But there are there are three groupings of acromion. So there are three different types of acromion. Uh, there's um, different types of humor, uh, humerus torsion. So you can have torsion um, of the humerus twist in one way, retroverted or anteverted. Uh, the glenoid. There are um, t uh, three groups of glenoid. Um, so the actual kind of uh, face of the glenoid can be shaped in different ways. Six groupings of suprascapular notch. Um, where the um, uh, suprascapular nerve comes through. The clavicle has five different groupings. And I kind of worked it out. And there are 8,640 possible combinations of scapula. Oh, my geez. <laughs> and, Sorry, uh, that wow, wow. And, that, and that's just from the ones that I, I was looking at. And uh, they're, they're bound to be um, more different things. And um, uh, so when you're looking at, you know, a slightly upwardly tilted um, scapula or something, you know, it's, it's just it's just impossible. It's it's I'm already getting slightly sweaty and nervous for anyone who's in this room. because I always underestimate the people in here. But of people who are thinking well if you take away this test and that test and that test then what the hell am i going to do because that's how i make a living especially with the younger therapists um have you i mean on your courses you said you see some level three sometimes how do yeah, you, yeah how do you stop people from getting nervous and tense and thinking that you're just kind of poo-pooing everything they've done and and letting them know that they, it's not throwing everything out you just get yeah, yeah. modify a little bit how do you do it have you got any tricks or I, th I think that's the key thing it's um it, it's how do you change the narrative and um how do you uh, now now knowing what you know now how are you going to change your message that you give to your patients um because um we know that the variations in anatomy are probably just normal so um we need to be telling people that we need to be letting people know and so that they have confidence to use their body again and uh, quite often the reason well we know reason for pain is multifactorial and um you know it's it's not just a, a simple case of um you know it, this is there so therefore that's going to cause you pain and um and quite often in clinic, I don't, I don't think I've seen many injured people. I see people in pain, 
but I don't see many injuries, so I don't think. And there's that, that difference between injury uh, and pain that is lost in translation somewhere. And I think the gap that fills it is the, is the changes in anatomy. And, uh, and that's wrong and, um, because, because we know that they're normal. It's, it, it, yeah, you're right. You, you just need to repackage it. I think. And I think it it opens up a whole new set of needs of CPD of how. Because imagine, like, I think all of our patients who come in have seen somebody else and probably are carrying some kind of catastrophe kind of idea that oh yeah, I know what's happened. I've I've got this, or I've got one leg longer than the other, or I've been told before that my glutes don't, or whatever. Something structural could be. Yeah. Because they've been given the tests, but it's it's an art to be able to not say yeah well that's wrong i i know what's right now without making that patient one either not trust you yeah, or two yeah. you know it's an art isn't it and it might take a few yeah. sessions before you can actually turn it around because the worst yeah. thing we can do is just dismiss something they've been told by someone else oh definitely yeah it's yeah. um uh, i say to my guys in the clinic here where you need to choose your battles um and uh, and drip feed the information through so what what do you think is the most important thing for this person right now uh, you're not going to change the whole ethos in in 40 minutes uh, that there's no way i mean if you think about us as learners and we're therapists and it takes us a year to learn about a pain science so how the heck are you going to get that information across to a patient in 40 minutes? It's just not going to happen. So uh, you have to slowly drip drip feed that in. Um, and I, I've become a lot more comfortable now with, um, uh, I used to be very, um, I still am hands-on. I still do hands-on work. I think there's benefit to it. Um, I've slowly started to switch now into more, um, probably 70% exercise and 30% hands-on, uh, whereas I would have been probably the other way around when I started. And uh, and I use those exercise sessions to to drip feed that information in um, all, all the time. And I, I have no problem with getting people back for weekly sessions of exercise and rehab. Um, well, not even rehab, um, but just fitness work really and strength training and um, and uh, and feeding them that information rather than booking them in for an, a massage every week. Yeah, uh, it's um, for for me that that that's that's my model. That that's where I I go. Yeah. I like the way you pick your words. You're definitely up there with what could be the implications of me calling it rehab as opposed to let's do some exercise or something because it's mm. it, it's I get it I get it. I've been in the same place as you, and it wasn't until I had like I think it was Mike Stewart who came along years ago and just yeah, yeah. made me look around my my clinic and go get rid of that get rid of that take that model away put that yeah. away and those posters it's uh, mike james um is in the house um have been lucky enough to spend many hours to dissect your room the only way to apply the textbook knowledge and paint the picture fully mike there was an interesting mike had i think you saw i think it was on instagram or maybe facebook he he's putting out so much stuff mike it was i think it was his 13th of today and it was an image of uh, why do therapists keep saying um, your glutes aren't fine or something? It's uh, a great yeah. valid point. It's a good one. And there was a lady in there. I don't know if she's in here tonight. Emi or something. Who I didn't see what she put. She deleted a comment because Mike came back. I think she thought, oh, because she said like like Mike's post was bashing other therapists. Yeah, like, yeah, taking yeah. I saw that. Yeah. It, you know. And I actually contacted her and I said, I just saw your post. And I wanted to say, well done for speaking up. Mm -hmm. I didn't see her original post. I mean, if she was like swearing blind and being crazy, then I shouldn't have done it. But just from the afterwards, she wrote back and said, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I'm just a bit sensitive, but I just get worried about therapists, younger therapists feeling like they're being told they're stupid because they come out with things. And I just said, we were all saying these things 10 years ago, some of us five years ago last yeah. year, you know, so it's good to stand up. And if therapists do feel they're being picked on, they should say something. Fortunately, in the case of Mike, he was able to come back with a great reply and say, oh, no, no, I understand what you're saying. And mm -hmm. he explained himself and said, you know, I, blah, blah, blah. And it was a great conversation. But I think anybody in the room, if you feel, because I worry if, if therapists are taking the mick out of other therapists on Twitter, how are they treating their patients? They're probably using the same language, you know? Yeah, 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 de definitely. Sometimes? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's um, uh, what did we post? Um, so, but I got da Daniel Williams working with me at the clinic, and um, he is a keyboard warrior. Uh, oh. He's uh, he's worth his weight in uh, Facebook gold. And um, he uh, he, I think it was about back last year, and um, we had to rein some stuff in because we were doing we were doing a lot of controversial posts about about stuff, but 
our intention is never ever to put anybody down that, that's not the intention at all is to educate and um and in 10 years time who knows what we're saying now and it may be different and I, i'm quite happy to um to move with wh wherever the evidence leads us and and i think that's that that's the message that needs to get across really is um uh, if you if you're thinking that and you're having that kind of thought about a comment like that, like you're being um, bashed, then it, it's it's probably done you good to make you think about the way you think. And um, so, but you need someone to push it. And I tell you, Adam Meekins did that for me years ago. And I remember some of the stuff that he was saying, and uh, I was like, you can't say that. And then, but then it made me research stuff. Because he was saying things that I'd not really heard about or read about, and um, and now I'm a much better informed therapist, I, th I think, than I was. And uh, but you, I think you need you need people to to push you, but you need to have broad shoulders as well. So. Mm. And just do lots of squats because that fixes everything. <laughs> yeah, obviously you can't yeah, go meetings. can't go wrong. I think Meekins. Uh... I've met him, so I know what he's like as a person. Obviously, you obviously met him as well. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes it depends. And the other thing is you can take things wrong because you just I, – I don't like people in capital letters. I don't like swearing. Meekin's yeah. always champion swearing. Producing papers mm -hmm. saying swearing means you're more intelligent. I don't like it. If someone's no. swearing in a, in a message, I'm like, well, yeah, you're using this language now to use it with your clients. I mean, can't yeah. you get this point across that way? Yeah. But I know that Meekin's and a few other people, you know, really, I think once I saw – Bonnie Thompson, if you follow her, who's like, yeah, who's, yeah, like, yeah, she was using the c word in one of her in you know, and I was like, ah, Bonnie, you've just shattered all my illusions of you. Yeah, but wow. it's just me, it's just me, you know. It's, some people really go down that road of, so yeah, each to their own. But um, yeah, it's good. Stick up for yourself if you do feel you're being bashed, but have a little think about whether, you know, what the reason for it was. And yeah, definitely. Anyway, right, before we bring up some videos, which I know you've got, let's have a little look through the comments. Uh, Catherine Reimer here. Hi, Catherine, how are you doing? Regional rep. I really want to go on a cadaver call. How do you say it? Cadaver, cadaver? I say, yeah, I say cadaver, you say cadaver. <laughs> cadaver for me. It's, it's, cadaver, I'm going to go with yeah, you. Yeah. No, 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 you. <laughs> I really want to go on a cadaver course, but I can't afford it yet. Also not sure if the smell. Okay, oh, so yeah, smell. Yeah, yeah, smell. So formaldehyde, which is what the bodies are set in, is uh, pretty stinky stuff. Um, it, uh, it's probably the thing that makes people feel uh, uh, more queasy than anything else. Um, because you can't breathe through your nose for the whole session, so uh, you you uh, you kind of breathing through your mouth all the time. So then your mouth goes dry because it's an air conditioned room, uh, and then you start to kind of hyperventilate a little bit. So uh, yeah, it, it it takes a bit of time to get used to. You're really uh, selling it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> There'll be a link for my courses uh, yeah. coming up at the end. <laughs> With that oxygen mask on the way in, um, but uh, yeah, it it is a bit smoke, but you you do kind of get you do get used to it. There's no other smell. Like like it on earth it's really weird so um to try to i can't describe it it's it's like nothing else it's it's basically like a dissection lab and, and that's it there's not mm. there's nothing else like it but um new for the body as well anything new for the body your system's going to defend you a little bit isn't yeah, it? yeah yeah but once yeah 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 exactly yeah we, we had one uh, lady on the last course we did uh she literally had just started her therapy career so a complete change of career uh booked onto this uh cadaver workshop and um uh and i could tell straight away that she she wasn't great and uh so she stood right at the back and um, we did some uh pro section stuff and we're talking through the skeleton and then um gradually um sort of hour by hour because it's about eight hours the whole day um she was gradually edging her towards uh, towards the cadavers and then by the end of it she was getting stuck in so it's um it, it you can uh, kind of back off for a bit and uh, and then just gradually introduce yourself to it um i never forget the and this is showing my age now but remember quincy and mm. um and where they at the beginning of quincy one of the doctors um faints in the in the cadaver room i've never had that i've never had anybody faint so um so that's so that's good we, we do keep an eye on people you know and um it's very respectful I think mm. um, when you go there, you, you're very humbled by being able, you know, that person has, has given their body to the lab um, and they're treated by the clinicians with the utmost respect. And uh, and we make sure that anybody who comes with us to, to those sessions uh, realizes that. And, uh, and we're also bound by the Human Tissue Act. So there are regulations in place that the uh, labs must follow. 
so that uh, we meet all of the requirements of the law. So, um, you know, you're actually legally bound to um, do certain things in the, in the lab while you're there as well. So it is a, it's a very, very clinical space and there's no mess, messing around in it. It's, it's proper, you know, um, it's proper medical learning. It's, uh, that, that's, what, that's what I really like about it, to be honest. Lovely comment here for you just to oh, bless build you. you up there. Right there. <laughs> First time listening to Mike Grice, but I've heard massive things. I'm rather impressed. There oh, you go. Yeah, I'll pay you Thanks. the tenor later, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel Gerber, hey, how, how are you doing? There's an osteopathic principle that structure and function are interrelated. Any evidence either way on dissection? That's a good question. Yeah, I think I think so. With um, uh, so my study that I did, so I did two years basically dissecting shoulders, and the reason why I did it, I was focusing on pec minor muscle because <clears throat> I read, I did a big literature review in my first year, and I was really interested in anomalies of the um, myology, so looking at the the muscle uh, differences, and. Um, there were there's a condition that actually uh, we've mentioned adam again adam meekin posted today i think on poland syndrome where in the development process in the, in embryology um for whatever reason we don't really understand why um but people don't develop a pec major and sometimes a pec minor it kind of skips that muscle and then the rest of the arm develops and th the way that i was described it by my um uh, lecturers was that uh, it's a kind of a sequencing so during embryology, um, thing uh, you've got a series of switches that all have to be switched on in a line, and you kind of go, that one's on, that one's on, that one's on, skip that one, that one's on, that one, and it's kind of that that happens, and with, they think it's to do with the blood supply to, to the pec doesn't develop, so then it doesn't get blood supply, so then it just atrophies and, and it doesn't grow. Um, so yes, definitely, the structure can affect the function you know you, you're going to get changes in the um, certain abilities of that shoulder but then they can be overcome so like uh, like the um the athlete that adam mentioned it um i can't it was some gymnast i think and it, it, just amazing feats of strength but with you know a pec pec major missing mm. so uh, you can you can overcome them i think uh, in osteopathic principles i think there's too much emphasis on it um if i'm if i'm entirely truthful kind of looking back with a critical eye if it's congenital then the body generally is pretty amazing isn't it uh, mm, yeah if you've had it from the beginning everything in your body every single cell is going to work around it and find a way you know just movement patterns and things exactly so. yeah 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 definitely i suppose if it's the result of some kind of trauma or incident then you can start working in it because maybe there is kind of maladaptions and things but yeah yeah but then there's um like breast recon reconstruction they'll use part of the lat um for the pec so where, when you start to try and move your arm again it goes in the wrong direction because the wiring is wrong um but then your brain start then switches and mm. the the nerves that supply that innovate the uh, the lats then start acting like a pec so you you can quickly adapt you know with that plasticity of the of the nervous system so it's, it's fascinating that's pretty cool stuff right i think let me just have a check i think we'll get to watch the first video which you're going to talk us through let me just check uh li, 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 li. timothy grigg mentions the body works it's very good the body was it body world or body work uh there were two yeah so body works is the um gunter von hagen's yeah one, and body worlds is the ripoff version but it's still it's equally as good oh yeah. right timothy yeah. you went for the uh ripoff version too so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um fine right let's go through to the first video we can come back to some comments on there these guys are having a little conversation amongst themselves now so we'll leave them to it um right so first video what we're going to bring up am i bringing up oh, let's bring it up uh we got a uh, sciatic nerve i think uh let me just get rid of that one because that's not a sciatic nerve Da, 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 da. Sciatic nerve. Let me have a look. So the the reason why I chose this one is um, there are six different uh, categories of orientation of sciatic nerve. So um, well, we just uh, talk uh, through that. Bear with me. I've got videos down here, and they are tiny. Actually, no. This is the one here. Here we go. Cool. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. So there's no sound to it. I'm just going to play it. What I'll do is let's arrange it a little bit more so we can have that on the bigger screen. What's the best way of me doing this? Actually, it might be worth me. 
doing oh, that. We can, still, we can still hear you. You're yep, still there, cool. aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll play it now and let you talk over. Cool. So um, this is a right uh, side of the pelvis. So uh, you've got the sacral plexus, which is uh, which forms the sciatic nerve. Uh, so um, nerves look a bit, I always say they look a bit like calamaris. Um, they've they got the same kind of consistency as calamaris as well. Uh, so let's just pause there. I just <laughs> wanted to, it's just reminded me, I wanted to say out loud, that we're, we're going to watch a video now. People. Yeah. Um, I just... Uh, yeah, there's a video obviously on the screen. So yeah, um, I hope you're not eating seafood right now. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, um, but, but, yeah. um, so where if you if you could just pause that for me, Matt, there. Certainly. Yeah, perfect. So where, where the needle is now, where he's pointing to, um, that um, the the ridge around the edge of that is the greater sciatic notch. So uh, that's in the back of the well, kind of lateral posterior part of the pelvis where the sciatic nerve will go through. Um, so it goes it goes from the front of the um, spine and then travels to the back through the greater sciatic notch uh, and then in a second it will spin around so if you so you've got all the uh, different nerves running off off of that and then um so you you the sciatic nerve is actually two nerves and uh, the way we see it in the textbooks is you it's usually just one um but the, so there's a big glute, me, uh, glute max, and then they take the glute max away, and then you're left with glute med underneath. And if you could pause it just there, that'd be brilliant. So um, if uh, so, where he's got the um, needle at the moment, so just uh, just to the side of that is the sciatic nerve, and then you can track it up, and you see that triangular shaped muscle uh, that's there. So that's the that's the piriformis. And um, and you can see the relationship, the close relationship with the sciatic nerve and the, and the piriformis there. So uh, <clears throat> the reason why I, I chose this uh, video, uh, this one doesn't really show any amazing differences in the anatomy, but there are six different classifications of um, sciatic nerve orientation. So um, the sciatic nerve is actually two nerves wrapped in a bundle. And uh, quite often I, I see more of them as two nerves than as one like this. And um, they, um, they they can they can split, and so in the textbooks it splits just um, just above the knee, the knee crease, so that um, popliteal fossa. Um, but um, quite often I've seen it split really high. So you'll have two two sciatic nerves, if you like, but well, it's a tibial and a perineal nerve running down the back of the hamstring, and then and then it goes whichever direction it, it, it needs to um, by the knee. Um, but it splits a lot higher up, usually, that, that I've seen anyway. Um, I think it's more likely to split higher, in my experience, than it is in like in the uh, Gray's Anatomy, where, where it splits just above the knee. Um, and then does it have an implication in... Um, uh, flexibility of the hips so we're going into extreme ranges of flexion I have no idea I, do, I don't think I don't think there's been ever been any studies on that correlating the kind of categories of, of a sciatic nerve and then and then how that might affect a nerve tension test or, or whatever I, I have no idea um, but uh, if anybody wants to look I've uh, written it down so it's called the Beaton and Anson classification and uh, so if you Google Beaton, B-E-A-T-O-N, and Anson, A-N-S-O-N, classification, then uh, you can see the six uh, variations of the of the sciatic nerve. Um, and when you go to the uh, cadaver labs, um, it, it's funny because on some specimens, they, uh, they actually color, because people are so used to seeing nerves as yellow, they color them in yellow. So you can see, and they um, so you can see where they are, but they're not actually yellow. They're quite translucent, like uh, like you saw on the on the specimen there. Um, you you pre-answered or preempted my question about like the implications of these, and I'll probably I'll ask you the same thing after each video. But so from what you've mentioned from the different variations, does it kind of nullify or weaken any of the tests or treatments or things we're used to doing or does it raise questions which we don't wouldn't normally ask I, I think it beautifully explains why the the tests and the treatments are poorly correlated in research mm. and it's because everybody's different so if you do a particular test or a particular treatment on someone and they don't respond 
it may be because they're a non-responder um, or it might be that they've got an anatomical variation that doesn't suit and you haven't done what suited them. So you just haven't found the thing that's worked for them. Um, who knows, you know, unless you unless you have a look at underneath, you, you wouldn't know. Um, but that it could be one of the one of the main reasons why we see these differences in, in the examination results and in the treatment results. Fascinating. Great stuff. Um, just checking if there's any questions to do with sciatic nerve before we go on to the next video. We're going to we've got five, so we're going to go through them. But you're welcome. If there's any particular questions or anything you want to share in the room. Um, Anna, hey Anna Maria, how are you? She was obviously insulted by the use of her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was Mike's choice of words. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> what was this here? Do, do, do. Would you recommend any good neural CBD for sports massage? Um, slightly off track. Well, if anyone knows any, then feel free to put that in the comments. Um, but I think that was part of another conversation that's going on. Yeah. Let's choose. Um, right. What video do you want next, mate? This is great. Um, so let's go for um, let's go pec minor. Um, so th this is um, this is where I I did my dissections on. So I um, taught you through this area. So, but my uh, my work was on um, the uh, it was on the attachment point on the coracoid because I'd read in the literature that. Uh, sometimes and because there's a test um, the pec minor test which is in Kendall Kendall McCreary where you um, where you have a look behind the shoulders with someone lying uh, supine and you see whether one shoulder is higher than the other um, we know that there are problems with that because of acromion sizes and all and all that kind of stuff and rib cage shapes um, but uh, but also the attachment point of the pec minor uh, on some people it doesn't attach on the coracoid it goes straight into the joint capsule so uh so that that was the kind of thing that i was um i was looking for just check if i get it off hold on that hasn't come up at all where is it it's a nice uh, comment by there sarah jones i couldn't eat pulled pork for a really long time after my course <laughs> Yeah, do you know what? Whenever you go to the cadaver labs, it um, it makes you really hungry, and it, all everybody does is relate um, things to uh, to food. So it's um, yeah, it's not surprising that we're getting there. Those comments coming through. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I've lost my videos. It's oh, here it is, right? Oh, here we go. Okay, do you want to put it on full screen? Yeah, cool. Yeah. You just say pause when you want to pause it again. Yeah, thanks, mate. Okay, so um, yeah, quick orientation there. So um, uh, top right of the screen. So that that's the neck area. So this is a right shoulder again. So we're looking at the front of it. So the uh, the kind of white thing in the middle there that you can see is the collarbone, and then the muscle on the sort of middle where brachial plexus is written uh, that's the deltoid uh, muscles there and then just inferior to that is the pec minor so you can see it attaching onto the ribs and then um, where the tendon attaches is on the coracoid uh, process um, so you can see here the relationship uh, what I really like on this one is uh, you can see the brachial plexus coming out of the musculature in the neck uh, so you can see the close relationship between the uh, scalene muscles in the neck and then the brachial plexus then nips underneath the um uh, the clavicle and then underneath that pec minor as well uh, and again you can see how close uh, those structures are to each other so when you're doing a test like um, a thoracic outlet test then once you've seen something like this you realize ah okay that's why it affects this part um, because not only do you have the nerves there, the brachial plexus, but you have the uh, the blood supply as well. So it can it can affect the the, the whole blood supply to the whole hand. And the, yeah, um, hopefully you take pec minor away now, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then you'll be able to see underneath. There you go. So it's like a, a roof on the uh, brachial plexus there with the um, pec minor. Um, but yeah, that, that with the variations of that was one that I mentioned before. So the the pec minor not going onto the coracoid, but actually going straight into the joint capsule. So um, that would affect that Kendall Kendall McCreary 
uh, test where you're uh, lying supine and, and measuring the, the height of the shoulders to see whether one shoulder is protracted or not. Because if it's not attached to the coracoid, it can't be the pec minor that's causing that um, protraction. It may be a, the orientation of the rib cage or, you know, there's lo again, loads of different variations uh, and a reason why that person may in that position present with one shoulder higher than the other. Uh, and is it a problem? That who, who knows? It, it could be. It might not be. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, fantastic video. Good example of that. And um, yeah, I'm hoping people in the room. Is there anyone in the room who hasn't? I'm interested in people in the room who haven't seen images like this before, or is everyone in the room kind of already looking up themselves on YouTube and stuff? Because you can obviously find various quality videos on YouTube. But I'm wondering if there's anyone in the room who is kind of new to seeing these or would like to see your reaction. Um, all these comments about meat and becoming vegetarian. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from there. Um, okay, great. Let's go to number three, uh, which is going to be which one would you like up? Uh, let's go. Uh, let's go. ITV. Yeah, that's a good one. ITV. Uh, so Anna's asked a question about how common are variations. Um, they are more common than not. Um, to be honest, that no, nobody. Um, I don't think I've ever seen two cadavers that look the same. Um, the way that the fascia lays down on the body. Um, lays down in the lines of stress and we know that anyway from from uh, muscle repair uh, with uh, scar tissue but it happens with um, fascial tissue and um, you can see clear differences in orientation of fibers from one person to the next and you can kind of, we have no idea what what kind of thing they did for a living we don't get that information um, but you can surmise that they did uh, we have one guy that um, uh, I can't remember which way around it was, but say it was right shoulder down to um, uh, left S ASIS, and there was a clear like stripe of fascia. Um, so he must have done some kind of repetitive rotation work throughout his life. M must have done. Uh, it's, it, um, there, there was um, you know, j just clear changes. Oh, we another one I saw as well, actually. Uh, this was in London, and we saw a glute max at the level of L3. Okay. So uh, the glute, and this was with uh, Julian uh, Baker. Um, oh. So uh, went on one of his workshops, and um, we uh, had to look at the glute of this one cadaver, and uh, yeah, tracked it all the way up, and the muscle fibers from the glute were going all the way up into L3, so that they had, um, yeah, they had a very high glute line. And this was on a cadaver, so there was no history of symptoms or anything, or no idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> you really want to know that would be my first question Who's I know yeah, you must yeah. Have some notes where are the notes of these people <laughs> oh interesting fascinating but yeah god your instant reaction inside I'm thinking well that person must have like had symptoms of some form but maybe they didn't if they were born like that exactly yeah no yeah. one ever knew no one knows yeah yeah how fascinating so that this one's a really cool one because this is um this kind oh, of oh sorry before you do one oh, question yeah. I uh, just got something which was interesting, as always, from Matt. Where was it? Let's have a go. That's Anna's Calamari. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is a question which crossed my mind as well. Obviously, these are pretty cleaned up for the videos. What does the brachial plexus actually sit within rather than empty space? Good yeah, question, good Matt. question. Fat. <laughs> you, you usually fat tissue. Um, so when I, did, when I did my dissections of the shoulder, it took me nearly a day and a half to pick out the fat wow lovely lovely that was, job that was uh, what a lovely thought yeah um stacy garner says i've never seen anything like this before um <laughs> <laughs> which so continue stacy how are you feeling let us know i'm just interested um i think it'd be useful research for for mike as well just to know what instant reactions is so yeah keep sharing stacy write something else how are you feeling at the moment are you still there stacy you're still there <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. Um, fascinating though. Yeah, cool. Okay, right. Sorry. Let's. Um, I'll start playing this video in a sec. Let's just hide that. Right. So, ITB. What are we going to see here before I start playing it? Give us a so, uh, right leg. Uh, I think it starts with an anterior view, so where the quads and rec fem would be. And uh, this just shows that the IT band isn't a band. Uh, so you can see it's a, it's a thickening of the fascia lata. Uh, which it basically just means white fascia. So it wraps all the way around the leg um, and goes all the way around and encapsulates everything. 
Uh, so uh, when you see the books, all of that fascia has been cut away and the iliotibial tract, which I'll show you in a second, is just where the person who's dissected it has cut. Right? And uh, they will cut along the lines where they think there's most um, fascia. So there you go. So there's the IT band. But when you see it in its entirety, um, you can see it's not a band. It's just a thickening of the whole fascia that surrounds the whole the whole leg. Um, you don't usually see that in the in the cadaver labs because uh, usually they've been dissected back, so you don't see that whole covering. Um, so that that's um, another kind of myth buster on that one. Very interesting, and a far more attached than we would imagine down the length of so the idea of moving it or changing its length or something is a little bit weird yeah as well, isn't yeah it? yeah definitely well um i'll tell you you know what i was saying about um uh doing that work for a, co a couple of days the the amount of scalpel blades you go through i know this is horrible to talk about but um you go through um i, th I think i must have gone through about three or four scalpel blades in a couple of days um because you know, the work the tissue is so tough it blunts the scalpels after some time and you and you can't get the the cut that you need um and um yeah i don't think people people really understand that the fascia is so so tough even like a bit of cross friction will have any effect on it nothing <laughs> surely it's been it's been shown <laughs> Especially as the client's not going to be writhing in pain. This is a great yeah, chance yeah, to actually absolutely. test out your, the yeah. strength of your fingers. Um, right, no, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. I just want to check if um, Stacy has come back with how she's feeling about it. Here she goes. No, she's not. That's Sarah. I think Stacy has uh, gone out screaming. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> Stacy's left the room. Oh, oh dear. Sorry, sorry Stacy. Um, yeah, no, I'd be really interested in seeing. There's so much. I was listening to a um a web chat last night all about the itb from someone who's done it in their phd and and uh, yeah just using again the research um to bust a few of the myths and misconceptions and um yeah very interesting right where are we 8 54 this is good timing next mate cool uh, let's go um let's go radial head next this is just because it's um it's probably one of the the most amazing anatomy videos i think i just um yeah it's it, the intricacy of how the elbow joint is designed is designed fascinating okay so it's just the so fully this margin it's just yeah where are you there it is Okay, so I missed that. I was trying to deal with little tiny live TV margins. What are we going to see in this? So uh, uh, radio ulnar joint. Yeah. So okay. um, yeah, re really nice. Um, shows the architecture of the joint and and how it how they interact with each other. So you've got yeah. the uh, r radial collateral ligament on the lateral aspects on the left there, and then it will spin around. So you got lateral aspect of the joint. Got the radial head, so you can see the elbow joint. The, um, humeral ulna joint and then that's the um, radial collateral ligament and then it's combined with the annular ligament which is the one that wraps around the radial head and you can just see that's Very the bit that's clever. cool that's yes. really, it's just so cool <laughs> so um, cool we're going to play it again okay, <laughs> let's go back and do that again so you imagine that rotation into pronation supination look at Beautiful. that Beautiful. it's just amazing and um they take away the humerus in a sec and just leave the um, just leave the annular ligament. And uh, talking about food again, it looks um, looks like a hula hoop. This one. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you can tell I've very watched, clean. You can tell I've watched these videos again and again and again. So, but look at the joint surfaces. Look how smooth yeah, yeah, yeah. that is. It's just crazy. So I guess how variable again it could be. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, like all the other kind of cavities, and yeah, very interesting. And then there you go. There's your hula hoop. So and that's called an annular ligament because annular, annular ligament means around the world, isn't it? So yeah, annular, <laughs> annulus, everything round. Yeah, very good. That's, I want to. I want to put that on again. Just forget everybody else in the room. I want to watch that again. That was amazing. <laughs> it's the movement, isn't it? It really gives you a nice idea of how 
joint services articulate and yeah and i think that when you're doing a, an elbow exam when yeah. you know this and you put oh, your hands on that radial head yeah it's just amazing beautiful yeah so to, and, th and that's the beauty of of knowing the anatomy like this you can grab hold of someone's arm and you and you can fit you can imagine what things are happening under underneath um <clears throat> yeah it's um it's just brilliant that is i, lo I love that one very nice um, but yeah. i have i have saved the best till last oh really um, let me just check if there's any questions on that here oh here we go there's a nice comment from um m turner who says i struggled whilst training to study looking at these videos but slowly become immune to my need to vomit <laughs> at the sight of them various books had good images but real life really does make you appreciate the complexity of the body yeah i think that's a Definitely. shared feeling isn't it well i have to say that these videos are for all from um robert ackland dr robert ackland and the a c l a n d so uh they are um I, uh, available on youtube i don't know whether they're supposed to be um but they are and um, so if you search for ackland on on youtube the the other guy to look out for is someone called the anatomy guy who's um he's a doctor in america and uh, he makes all of his phd students uh, do videos uh, of anatomy so and they do some medical procedures as well so the anatomy guy is really good as well cool stuff okay we'll make sure these are put in the links and stuff in the comments so people can jump to them um i'm not going to start off a conversation that's someone used the release word can you imagine it let's not use that uh there's a lot catherine going on about here I don't know what that's all about so let's go to that no that's their own little conversation going that's fine okay yeah. so yeah you say you've saved the best till last have you yeah spinal um, cord okay and that was over here here we go i told you i was looking forward to this i could i could literally do this all the uh, way through tonight that's <laughs> fascinating really is fascinating i mean i'm sold i'm sold it's really uh and I've struggled with sensitivity and this sort of stuff. I mean, I'm a begrudgingly non-vegetarian now. I wish I was a vegetarian I, um, because I just don't like meat or cutting and stuff and, and, and also a bit of animal love. But um, And I've always been squeamish. I, I always was one of the people who said, yes, I will go out during the bullseye dissection and stuff like that. And the frogs. <laughs> so it's, even though I studied biology and applied biology, I just wasn't interested in seeing animals cut up. It was just yeah, animals. yeah. But, but so it did take me a while to get used to these kind of videos myself um but once you get over that body works really worked for me it was great um, yeah. because it introduced me nicely to it and once you got over it and, and it's the art isn't it the yeah human definitely. body is this is probably the most beautiful yeah. work of art we can appreciate because it's our own bodies so once you can get past just the flesh and stuff then it's yeah it's a beautiful thing right um what we're going to see on this before i click play spinal cord so um we got uh, the spinal cord from the um foramen magnum which is the uh, hole in the base of your skull um spinal cord all the way down into the cord equina and then it also shows when the uh, meninges are opened up and you, you can actually see see the cord inside so it's the kind of uh, the reveal of the spinal cord if you like but it's a, okay. it's a good good one this one so a look Yeah, here we go. So that's the um, uh, dual sac. Oh, it's gone a bit quick. Sorry, let me take it No, was that you or me? <laughs> no, that, I, I think thought... that was me. There we go. I'll hit pause when you say. Sorry, mate. Um, yeah, so dual, So that that's the uh, meninges. Yeah. So if you heard of meningitis before, um, you get an inflammation of the meninges. And uh, the meninges are the um, are the coverings of the spinal cord, so they get they wrap around the brain and come all the way down the spine. So that's why meningitis is so um, uh it's so uh dangerous because really? um it, it just just straight down the whole the whole cord um, what a great visual i mean seeing that i've read about meningitis and i'd like to think i know what the thing is but i've never seen an image like that before of the meninges and that just yeah it's better than all the words you could put together that's amazing yeah no, sorry keep going that's, that's all right yeah and then uh yeah if you hit play again it should there you go yeah so it um tracks it down the video does jump across. yeah so it might be my video actually apologies i'm just pausing it when i see uh differences 
here we go so there's the corda equina so the corda equina this the spinal cord actually stops at the level of l1 l2 uh, so it's called the conus and then uh, and then it turns into the corda equina then after that so it's filled up of um, nerve filaments that make up then the uh, the plexus um, that form the uh, lower extremity uh, nerves so that's your uh, that's in the sacral area i think that one mm -hmm. and then hopefully in a sec here we go this will be it yeah oh. so it, it kind of op opens up the meninges hopefully yeah here we go amazing i'm just pausing this so i can take it all in there you go and there's your spinal cord so the thing oh, that God. thing that controls or sends messages and um, to uh, and receives messages from every part of your body and there it is it's, it's just mad you know um seeing that and the kind of role it has um <sighs> with it with our everyday life and and, that, and that's it you know it's it, it's just amazing absolutely great let's play that through to the end amazing video yeah definitely put the link through to these absolutely amazing video cool i think that's oh, it's it. yeah. quite emotional that's uh, that's that's quite emotional um amazing there's an interesting reference here i was going to avoid mentioning him because it's kind of quite a classic era i think the famous kind of fuzz video which we were introduced to as a way of selling my official release with, yeah but it's a great he was so ahead of his time wasn't he he was yeah um, yeah and yeah this famous fuzz video and then well basically it was kind of like yes but for this to happen you have to be dead it was kind of a little bit which he came back with but he, again <coughs> i used to kind of poo poo a bit when i was younger and doing workshops like oh look at this example but yeah, yeah. he was saying that before anybody else was even talking about it and then yeah, he came back definitely. with a follow-up video yeah well i think that's the good thing with a scientist though mm. so gil realized after that time that his first thoughts weren't right so he mm. he changed them and that's exactly what you should do and yeah, yeah and uh, you, you know you've got to be you've got to have balls to do that especially after you've been you know selling videos talking about the fuzz and then and mm. then completely changing what your your message is um i yeah respect to him for that all of the great thinkers have said things ahead of the time when no one else was talking about it. you look at the whole studies um on the core stability and the multifooders and the timing and all of that that was said and then they came back and said, oh, it's interesting. Actually, we've changed it a little bit, but it was too late. By then, yeah, you'd yeah. spawned a whole breadth of DVDs yeah, yeah. and core stabilization exercises. So Pull they check. all have. Yeah, exactly. Pull Same sort of things. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But it doesn't take away. And that's the way it should be. If you are um, um, so intelligent and, and doing such great research that you release these new things, you don't know whether it's going to be 100% right. You then evolve. And that's something I think as therapists we can take away. It's great to have to correct yourself. If you're yeah. teaching the same thing as you, you know, with, or you're treating the same way as you did five, ten years ago, then you're probably missing out on something. Definitely, it's natural that things should change. And I think, as well, I think some therapists fear saying to a patient, "You know what? You know, I did this kind of last time you came in two months ago. I've changed it a little bit since then because I think that's patients love hearing that. They want to yeah. hear that you've actually evolved and you're reading and looking stuff up." definitely um it's like opening a book up in clinic i'll still sometimes if i'm interested or if i'm feeling something or i'm seeing something i'll go and look at a little atlas or something or open up a book and they they love it they're like yeah. oh wow that's amazing you know rather than making it up so right well this is um there were some great videos mike absolutely brilliant cool. um let's uh take that down for a sec so it's 905 now let's bring up i took this snapshot of your website which Thank people you. can go to what are people going to see if they go to your website i'll put this on the screen so yeah so we've got um there's a few things that we do we do um we do a level five uh diploma um which is um uh it's embedded with all uh, pain science throughout um all of this stuff about anatomical variation we of course we teach you know the special test but we also teach the validity and reliability the sensitivity specificity of those tests so which ones are any good um but then to be able to critically analyze them as well i think that's that's a key part of our course but the the co our course is three years long so it's a it's a three-year diploma um and the idea was to give you because i used to teach on degree level programs so i wanted to give people degree level content 
um, in a in a manageable way. So um, people that couldn't go to university for whatever reason um, or didn't want to, they don't really they're not wanting to saddle themselves with 27k worth of debt um, and uh, and and different way of of learning that kind of level of information because. Um, I think with with levels, um, Gary and I have talked about this for a number of years. The um, it was kind of level three was effleurage, petrissage, and then level four you learned METs, and then level five you did electrotherapy, and and it was all technique based for the levels, and and it shouldn't be like that. It should be um, the uh, understanding and your justification is is where you get the higher levels, and and that's what we try to. Uh, try to do on our on our course um, and then the middle button is the anatomy lab stuff so obviously we're, we're not we don't have any dates at the moment but if anybody's interested then just let me know and uh, we can pop you um, pop you on a, a mailing list so we can mail out when when we've got the dates coming out and um, uh, I work with rock tape as well so I know I've met I recognize some of your um, some of your names from the rock tape courses but I work with the rock tape guys and uh, we do um, elements of the diploma as CPD as well so I think someone mentioned about neurological testing we do a neuro testing day uh, as part of the phase three in our diploma course um, and we we teach you um, uh, again, what you what you would get on a degree program, so myotomes, dermatomes, but cranial nerve testing as well. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a fairly in depth uh, diploma. Ah, oh, bless you, Katie. Thank there you. There you go. You've got some uh, testimonials there from Katie. Fantastic. Um, we've had some lovely. Um, I'm glad that people felt are sharing their emotions the same way as I was at the other end. Yeah. Beautiful, amazing work. And they're just five examples. So um, I imagine the look at this. Sophie has expressed it with a wow, 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 wow. Yeah. Um, and then Louise Archer, has, Louise Aker, stop saying Archer. I always call Louise Aker Louise Archer because my son's called Archer. <laughs> so sorry, Louise Aker has um, taken it even further and she's decided, um, I think I'll donate my body to science. So that's quite a oh, good, good on you. Yeah, good on you. Yeah, that's, that's the, no, it's brilliant. And and they um, what they do with that just very quickly because I know we're over time, that's but um, we're um, uh, they they do things on postcode. So if uh, you look for the local university that has cadaver labs, and then you fill in a form, and um, and then on your passing, then you'll be you'll be collected and donated to that lab. So uh, yeah, they do it in in postcode regions. Brilliant. Okay. Right. Well, time has made that was, it was amazing. Really, really. I thought tonight was going to be great, but it's even exceeded my expectations. Um, I feel yeah, it's amazing. Great. Thank of you. Videos to watch, and I'm sure I'm sticking my name down for sure. But yeah, so people can hit that middle button. They'll go onto a mailing list for the next time one comes up. Um, anything else have you got? Your chance um, to do anything else you're doing in the near future? I'm doing a couple of online courses until we're back face to face again, but with the with the rock tech guys. So um, just doing some uh, instrument assisted and rehab work. So uh, uh, with a neurocentric approach. So um, yeah, they're doing all the kind of pain science stuff with, uh, but getting people moving rather than just uh, on a couch. So uh, um, yeah, I think that's coming up in September, September 12th, I think. But so uh, yeah, online one, we've got a private mm -hmm. Facebook group and you uh, put your videos of you doing doing the techniques into the into the group so we can assess it. So we do, do it that way. We had Coco in the other day who I think left people with jaws down and quite flabbergasted at the sheer <laughs> amount of amazing things. So oh, I mean, he's always, nice. yeah, it was brilliant. Um, who's obviously not with rock tape anymore, but I think in his time there, he had some great effects on the company. That's oh, the definitely. I stayed with rock tape from the beginning. It was lovely to know that he was there in the yeah. UK sowing his seeds as it were. So that was great. All right, mate. That's so kind of you to give up your time. It's been really exciting. Um, no worries. I think it's probably been the biggest teaser of give me more that we've probably had. <laughs> so episode 13 was not an unfortunate one. It was absolutely the opposite. So good. thank you so much. If people want to contact you, it's via the website. It's the best way, is it? Uh, yeah, via the website. Yeah. As uh, Katie, uh, who commented earlier, knows, if you message me, then uh, it takes ages for me to respond. <laughs> I tell you, I've, I've just been so ridiculously busy. We're getting everything ready with all COVID stuff. So apologies, Katie, on air. Okay, there you go. Uh, but yeah, email me. It's mike at mtclinics.com if anybody wants to get in touch. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, mate. Right, I'm going to chuck you down to the lobby whilst I just say goodbye to people and then I'll come and say thank you again myself. Okay. Cool. So thank you very much again, Mike Rice. Thank you. Wow. Wasn't that great? Um, that was fantastic. 
um i um, i'm really am clicking that button i can't wait to go and do one that's amazing and also hopefully having mike just the way he explains it and everything well you know i think everyone in here knows that mike's a bit of a legend um if you don't know mike and it's the first time that you've well there was somebody wasn't there um then um well you've got testimonies in here from everybody great educator really up to date from the information he was saying embracing human uh, natural variation um and embracing asymmetry and and embracing the fact that we shouldn't be laughing at each other or laughing at things and new therapists because it's natural to evolve we've all done it you know we've all changed hopefully we should have done and like i say if you haven't then there's always time to change it bit by bit right so before i do let you go i just want to for those of you who've been emailing me i know a few of you have about um the run chat live conference um i put out a post today um, basically i've got to make some decisions i've got a man up and um or person up i should say and um i've got to decide whether it's going to be physical and live stream or whether it's going to be 100 percent live stream so what i've done is i've decided that august the 31st is the deadline um basically if i've got enough people to warrant hiring the hall and getting the catering and getting the staff and paying the college and everything to put on the physical version in brighton uk like last year if there's enough people signed up for the physical tickets then yeah we'll do it i want it to be physical i want to see people i want to get the speakers together and um, that's what it's all about for me it's about getting people into the room and, and kind of stopping black mirror from becoming reality uh, whilst we can obviously if not enough people want to and it's understandable in these weird COVID times if not enough people want to come to the event um, or they're worried um, that, I mean, I've already said, if you do get a physical ticket and it can't happen, it will be converted straight away to a fantastic virtual Zoom one, which we're organizing as we speak. Um, I've made the prices for the physical tickets now the same as the virtual, just because that makes people feel a little bit more settled. So basically, if you do fancy the idea of going now to Brighton and meeting up and seeing the speakers, um, remember, the British speakers are still all happy to go down there. So you'll have the likes of Tom Goom, um, Ben Cormack, uh, Trevor Pryor, uh, Mike James will be down there again. Um, we've got some fantastic UK speakers who are going to be there. Um, we'll have a virtual connection to Matt Fitzgerald. Um, so he'll be talking from um, California. Alice San Vito is going to be talking from St. Louis, Missouri, about massage and the misconceptions and things. And also Kevin Max, a running form, will be talking from um, united states as well um so yeah august the 31st i'm simply going to look at the eventbrite page count up the number of physical tickets and go it's not enough if it's not enough it will become 100 percent virtual and all physical tickets will be converted across so if you're umming and erring and you're thinking oh i do want to get out of bright i need a holiday i want to meet people obviously all of the social um health and safety measures will be put into place as and when they're needed and given that date october 29 30. so don't worry about that it's in a working college so believe me the health and safety procedures we've already put in place to be able to have thousands of students coming in and out each day have been put in there. It's during the half terms, so you're not going to have loads of students coming in. It will just basically be us and a few cleaners, which is great news. Um, if you fancy the Brighton thing, do get a ticket before August the 31st because I've just got to make this, this decision before then. Um, hopefully, some of you do. Hopefully, some of you are going to know and you just go, yeah, let's do it um, because it'll be a great crack getting you in the same rooms to speak and be on a network, which is so important. Um, there is obviously a promo code for SDA members. SDA 20 will get you 20% discount. And now I've bought the physical price down to the same as virtual. You're getting, well, I think a pretty good deal, but I'm biased um, because I'm organizing it. But yeah, consider it, have a look. Right, um, just thought I mentioned that at the end. Um, I'm not sure who we got next week because it's been such a busy week organizing this. Um, but as always, if you want somebody or you feel you want to come up and be a guest, um, then do contact either myself, uh, Matt at the sta.co.uk or contact Gary uh, at the sta.co.uk and uh, we can get you or can also, I'd like to get some regional reps up. I'd like to sort out maybe two or three of you at the same time for a chat about obviously the return COVID-19 is an interesting subject, but it could be something totally different. It could be something totally different you want to talk about. Uh, so yeah, do feel free to email me or Gary regarding that. Right. That's it, guys. Um, I it's so good tonight. I've got to explain why I'm 15 minutes late to my wife, but that's that's fine. It was worth it, I think. And yeah, it was worth it. Right, thanks so much, guys. Um, keep, keep this feed going. Obviously, Mike will be back in in case you've got any questions, or if not, we'll feed them to Mike to keep talking about stuff. And um, yeah, we'll see you next week with oh, I don't know who's next week, but they've got some big feet, big shoes to fill. But we will be back at the same time on the page, which worked out very nicely. All your comments came up. 
eight o'clock spread the word as always share it let's get a lot of non-members in here as well to show them how nice we are to each other and how we don't bash any therapists right take care and uh, we'll see you soon have a great week